Inside these walls lived Ivan the Terrible and Peter the Great. Beneath these towers walked Tolstoy and Chekhov. Along this way passed a composer named Tchaikovsky coming home from a concert. And an astronaut named Titov back from outer space. One sixth of the world. Stretching from the eternal summer of the Crimea to the ice islands of the Arctic Circle. A land so vast from border to border that when a housewife in Zelenogorsk on the Gulf of Finland is just waking up in the morning, a ship's engineer is watching twilight come to Petropavlovsk. Georgians and Armenians, Ukrainians, Bokharians, Latvians, Estonians, Moldavians, Uzbeks and Kalmyks, Turkmens and Tatars, an architectural student from Kursk, a biology instructor from Kharkov, a herdsman's daughter from the hills of Tashkent, the son of a taxi driver from Pskov. They have an old proverb, Whatever man wishes to see in our mother Russia is there to find. It just depends on how you look at it. Before Moscow was born, a thousand years ago, when all this was only a wind-swept wilderness, the bells were already ringing over the holy city of Kiev. In the Perchersk Monastery, monks now conduct visitors through catacombs older than the Magna Carta. Here, where the winds blow west toward the Polish border, the old echo of a Gregorian chant mingles with the tambourines of the Ukrainian dancers, just back to Kiev from a tour of Paris, London, and New York. According to an ancient legend, here on the banks of the river Dnieper ten centuries ago, Prince Vladimir once considered bringing his realm into the Muslim faith, flourishing a thousand miles to the east, in the shadow of China, at Samarkand and Tashkent. <laughs> Citizens of Tashkent, Uzbeks and Tatars, Descendants of the wild horsemen of Genghis Khan and the troops of Tamerlane. Sons of the Golden Horde that came pouring down out of the mountains of Mongolia across this caravan route to the Caspian Sea. In this heartland city of Soviet Central Asia, Alexander the Great once maneuvered his legions, leaving behind a local passion for strategy. The old quarter, 
along the road where once silks and spices journeyed between Peking and Persia. The old quarter, ancient, whitewashed, built from the clay they call Guala. And a stone's throw away on Kwebyshev Street, a modern hotel faced with the same blue mosaic used in the time of Tamerlane. There have been a few changes made in Tashkent since the goatskin tent days of the Mongol warriors. The new city, a university and an academy of sciences. An opera house that's apt to feature Rigoletto sung in Uzbek, the local tongue that goes back to the Tartar tribes that swept through here and on to the gates of Moscow. Moscow. The Kremlin. A city within a city. A cluster of palaces and churches. Cathedral Square, child of Ivan III, Grand Duke of Muscovy the home of so many astonishing rulers, warriors and fools, geniuses and madmen. Ivan the Terrible, shuffling in his jewel-encrusted slippers through a nightmare world. Seven-foot-tall Peter the Great, sailor and shipbuilder, building factories and highways, cracking the whip of history, sending Russia galloping out of the Dark Ages. Turning for inspiration to Amsterdam and Paris, Peter and his dream, to open a window on the west. Pushing the frontier to the seaport towns along the Baltic, Riga. The streets still speak of another century. And the government commission store, a sort of second-hand shop is a bargain hunter's paradise for antiques. Peter's windows on the west, Riga on the Baltic, and St. Petersburg, where the river Neva sweeps out into the Gulf of Finland, the city that Pushkin called Gem of the Northern World. Its name is Leningrad now, but it still bears the stone signature of Peter the Great. Buildings like mirrors reflecting the styles of all the capitals of Europe. Home of one of the world's most spectacular art museums. The Hermitage. 117 exhibition halls hung with some of the greatest art of the last thousand years. Da Vinci. El Greco and a staggering collection of French modernists. Rousseau, Van Gogh, Gauguin, Matisse, Renoir, Picasso, Leningrad, city where Catherine the Great built herself a winter palace, the riches of the Romanovs the treasures of a gilded world that came to an end on a morning in October 1917. A cannon shot from the cruiser Aurora out in the harbor, giving the signal for the storming of the Winter Palace. Exit the Romanovs. Enter the revolution. Commemorated each year in the celebration that streams across Moscow's Red Square. The Russians. The crisscross design of humanity that so fascinated Dostoevsky inspiring him to write in his notebook. Я люблю, бродя по улицам, вглядываться в лица прохожих незнакомцев и размышлять. I like when roaming the streets to look attentively at certain holy strange passers-by, study their faces and speculate. Who are they? How do they live? What is their occupation? What are they thinking? What are they saying? Thank you. 
воздушные шарики. Купите воздушные шарики. Шарики. Buy a bunch. Take home a little pleasure. I'm 69 years old and I still bring home flowers to my wife. Tell you how to get there. Get on the Sokolniki line. Get off at Kirovskaya station. What do you mean you're afraid of getting lost? If you've got a mouth, you can't get lost. This morning is the child of yesterday. Born into a land with 1,200 years of national tradition. In the far eastern hills of the Uzbek Republic, children who may one day grow up to be neurosurgeons and nuclear physicists learn the ancient dances with a flavor that speaks of Persia to the south and of India just across the Himalayas. in the wind, blowing west across the cotton fields of the Fergana Valley. West a thousand miles across the Ural Mountains, across the Volga to where the broad steppe land of the Ukraine rolls toward Poland. Mile after mile of Chernozon, the famous black earth of the Ukraine. A farmer in the Don Valley like a character out of a novel by Sholokov. The step seemed to stretch away to the end of the world, beautiful, tranquil, strong. A mother preparing to feed her children. The reaper is like a galleon in a golden sea. Most of the fields and pastures, the tractors and barns, belong to collective farms, many of them sprawling over 10,000 acres. Something of the old-time Ujik, the tough, leathery, indestructible peasant, remains in these collective farmers. Something they sum up in a very Russian word, Vinoslavost. An earthy, stubborn endurance. The Russian countryside. The country smells and the country sounds. Still much the same as when Turgenev described him in his sketches. A lark singing somewhere. A dog barking. The scent of sweet grasses and ripening berries. The echo of a woman's voice in the summer air. Now the land belongs to the collective. Though each family owns its house and a little garden where it can grow vegetables and fruit for its own table. Or to sell in the free market. You find them in every city. Moscow alone has more than 30. 
The public stalls are rented out to collective farmers who come in from the countryside to sell the harvest of their gardens. Shopping in the free market is a sort of sporting event. Somewhere between blind man's buff and button button who's got the button. You never know what may turn up. The housewives call their shopping bags a voiska, perhaps bags. Free markets for food and free markets for flowers. The Russians have a passion for flowers. They give them for any occasion, any occasion, or for no reason at all, except a breath of beauty. Every city has its public gardens. Kerch and Krasnodar, Sevastopol and Odessa. Odessa, a sunlit southern harbor across the Black Sea from Turkey. Odessa, where young Maxim Gorky worked as a stevedore on the docks. And Russia's towering playwright and poet Alexander Pushkin walked under the lime trees. But most of all, a city of musicians. Misha Elman was born here, and Yasha Heifetz. And from here, the pianist Gilels and the violinist Oistrock set out on the world tours that brought them cheers from Stockholm to San Francisco. As soon as the Russians get a holiday, they seem to head for the water. Mention Black Sea to a Russian and the first thing that will flash into his mind is vacation. From Odessa, the ship set sail on the three-day cruise of the Soviet Riviera to the resort towns of Sochi and Sukhumi the Tumi and Yalta. First port of call, Yalta. The cliffs of the Caucasus against the pure Crimean sky. From Moscow and Smolensk, from Riga and Rostov, they journey here for the sunlight and the sea winds and the salt air. Yalta to Sochi and beyond. The hills are planted with hotels and rest homes. Some of them former palaces of the Grand Dukes. Some of them built only recently. It's a little hard to tell which are which. The new rest homes have the same extravagant architecture as the old villas of the aristocracy. Except that today, instead of a duchess crossing down the marble staircase, it's likely to be a streetcar conductor from Samara or a pastry cook from Petrovsk. As late as 1950, a foreign visitor in the Soviet Union was almost as rare as a giraffe. Now, here in the south, the promenades along the Black Sea are filled with travelers. Tourists from Paris and Copenhagen, from Seattle and Schenectady. A casual atmosphere. A place where you can exchange a recipe for Boston baked beans for a recipe for chicken Kiev. 
discuss Shostakovich and Dixieland jazz, compare California wines with the Crimean. Cypresses and sequoias lining the mountain roads that curve eastward into Soviet Georgia. Tbilisi, capital of the Georgian Republic. It's significant that the main street is named after a poet, Rustaveli. Georgians have a reputation for poetry and a flair for drama. The city reflects the character of its people. Passionate, witty, lovers of good wine and handsome women. They say, when the creator first distributed gifts, he forgot the Georgians. To comfort them, he gave them the gift of laughter. These ancient walls have echoed the trumpets of 20 invaders, Greeks and Persians, Turks and Mongols. The narrow streets of the old city were planned that way to keep the invading cavalry from riding more than two abreast, a city of castles and fortresses. Immortalized in Rustavelli's epic poem, Night in Tiger Skin, telling of Queen Tamara, who 700 years ago ruled over Georgia from her throne in Mataki Castle, rising above the swift Kura River like a stone sentinel. A land of great rivers, their names sounding a concerto of history. The Dnieper and the Don, the Vistula and the Volga, they weave like blue threads through the songs and legends of the country, through the poems of Pasternak and the novels of Maxim Gorky, born and raised on the banks of the Volga. When you go sailing down the flowing river, your heart swells. You are stirred to tears by the loveliness. And there's nothing you need, nothing you want, but to follow her on and on. The river's taking you to Novgorod on the Volkov and Leningrad on the Neva. A boat ride down the Neva to Peterhof. Russia's Versailles. The royal playground of the Tsars now turned into public gardens. The trick fountains that so amused Peter the Great. The city bathed in sunlight, as though sitting for its portrait by Dostoevsky. There is something inexpressibly touching in nature round Petersburg when at the approach of spring she breaks into leaf. Somehow, I cannot help being reminded of a frail girl who suddenly, in one instant, becomes inexplicably lovely and exquisite. Leningrad is the tender soul, but Moscow is the heart. This city that fires the imagination of Cossacks in the Don Valley, figures in the dreams of fur trappers in far Siberia, all of them calling it Moskva Minoga Galova, many-headed Moscow. city. Soaring up over the Lenin Hills, the 32-story skyscraper of the university.
the sound of jackhammers in the morning air. New housing projects going up. The profile of the city is a study in contrasts. The changing of the guards at Lenin's tomb on a Monday morning in November. A riverbank on a Tuesday morning in April. A football stadium on a Saturday afternoon in September. An apartment house that might be anywhere. An opera house that could only be Moscow. The Bolshoi. A restless, talkative city. Horn blowing is against the law. And there's a stiff fine for running down a pigeon. To the Russians who pour in daily from the provinces, this is it, the dream metropolis. They come to sit in the restaurants, to dance in the cabarets, to gaze in the shop windows along Gorky Street. Moscow at night is the flashing signs. Moscow at night is the theater, Obratsov's puppets, and the Moiseev dancers. The stage of the Bolshoi ballet exploding into the fountains of Bakchesarai. Moscow at night is the movies. Moscow at night is the circus. Moscow on Saturday night is the circus. Moscow on Sunday morning is Gorky Park. Citizens of the USSR. More than 200 million human beings. One sixth of the world. In November, on the anniversary of the revolution, they gather from every city and village to march in Moscow's Red Square. Citizens of all the 15 republics, Estonian and Belarusian, Armenian, Turkmen, Uzbek, Kazakh, Georgia, Azerbaijan, Lithuania, Moldavian, Latvian. 
delegations from the cotton mills of Tashkent, oil drillers from Baku, stevedores from the docks of Riga, tractor drivers from the Ukraine, lumberjacks from the pine forests of Siberia, chemical engineers from Kiev, telephone operators from Leningrad, the USSR. No statistics can capture its character. No map can state all its meaning. Only the human ear can record its voice. Only the human eye can fashion its portrait. Out of a thousand details comes the living mosaic of a country, of the USSR.